Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So it is that time of the week again for the Q&A, my weekly Q&A. Thank you all for submitting your questions. We had 28 comments, which is fantastic. Um, now, I'm probably not going to get to all of these tonight. So if you ask a question and I didn't answer it, don't take it personally. It's possible that I just don't feel like I have much valuable to say on that particular topic. Um, so with that disclaimer out of the way, let's hop right in here. Uh, hey, Brad, what do you think about using Berkshire B as an alternative to cash in this environment? Buffett mentions in his last letter they will continue doing buybacks, so that means he considers the stock undervalued with all the cash they have. It looks like the downside could be minimal. Any thoughts? So I do have thoughts about that. Uh, to me, a cash alternative uh, means you know there's there's very limited downside. But to me, that's like maybe ten percent, five to ten percent. Uh, I think Berkshire. You know, obviously, over the long run, I think Berkshire is very low risk, okay? Uh, in terms of a stock market crash, some kind of an event like that, I still think Berkshire could fall by a third um, from where it is now. It could fall back down to $170, somewhere in that ballpark per share. So I don't necessarily see it as a cash alternative where... You know, if the stock market crashes, I could sell Berkshire to buy some really cheap, cheap stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've been talking about certain SPACs as cash alternatives, uh, where if you buy a SPAC close to NAV, you know, maybe it falls 5%, 10% tops, I think. Uh, that, to me, is a much more suitable cash alternative, where, you know, with with... A fair bit of certainty you can get most of that back if the market crashes to deploy that capital into bargain opportunities um, that that come up when a stock market crash happens so I don't see it as a cash alternative um, you know Buffett does seem to think that it's undervalued with all of the buybacks and you know I, I think it's a great long-term bet um, if you're wanting to make you know solid returns nothing nothing egregious obviously with how much capital Berkshire Hathaway has um, so it's a great business I haven't been buying it um, and I don't see it as a cash alternative <clears throat> Marco how when did you start investing and if you are managing other people's capital would you change something in your investment process or how you build your portfolio great questions so I invested in my first individual stock, I think it was like 2015, maybe 2016, so like five years ago. Um, I did it because I, I really started to understand the power of compounding and also uh, that the efficient market hypothesis wasn't quite right. You know, there's this whole school of you know value investors from Graham and Doddsville who have managed to outperform the market over decades. And so, you know, I thought, oh, that, that's interesting. I should, I should explore that and see if, you know, I can also outperform the market, doing a little bit of work, doing some shameless cloning. And because, um, you know, when you look at the formula, the, the compound growth formula, it's really what you input, right? Capital in. Uh, rate of return and length of runway. Okay, so you know the the rate of return is pretty important when it comes to compounding capital. Uh, I'd say the length of the runway is is more important. Um, but if we can do things to increase that rate of return, I mean, it just has a huge impact over decades. So th that got me excited to start looking at individual companies. If I was managing other people's money, yeah, I wouldn't have as much concentration. Same, same as Pabrai. So in Pabrai funds, where he's managing other people's money, he won't make more than a 10% bet. So he won't put more than 10% of the assets in the fund into one idea. 
um, he'll let it grow bigger than 10%. Um, obviously, I mean, you got to kind of let the winners ride a bit. Um, but I, I would probably do something similar. Right now, um, I'm making like 20% bets is kind of where I'm at at the moment. Um, if I was managing other people's money, I would probably take that back to 10% bets. Uh, investing with Frank, what valuation methods do you use when looking at a company? Do you use DCF? What else do you consider? I do. Uh, DCF is my preferred, um, kind of my most kind of critical method of valuation. Um, what else do I consider? You know, I consider the acquirer's multiple. Uh, I consider return on invested capital. I consider, you know, some of these kind of more more prominent uh, metrics within the, the value community. Um, but yeah, the DCF, it's kind of the gold standard for me, right? Can I project cash flows out 10 years? Um, and, you know, at what rate do I discount those back? Um, I like to use a 15% discount rate. That's kind of what Phil Town uses. I think that's uh, pretty pretty conservative in terms of, you know, finding a solid margin of safety. So I like to be conservative with um, with that approach. Um, but yeah, it, it's really, you know, with each company, it's different. What, what are the, you know, couple, two or three levers that really move the needle in terms of uh, returns that that company generates for shareholders? So... Uh, it's it's pretty company specific on that one. Uh, how do you value companies that are listed for one to two years, like Beyond Meat, for instance? Um, so, you know, company goes public, you know, within one or two years, what do you do? You have a couple of years of, of data. Well, hopefully, you know, you, you've got more than that. Um, you know, I haven't bought companies that, that are fresh, off IPOs, really, um, but I presume you could get more insight into, you know, what the financials were when that company was private. Um, I don't know because I haven't I haven't really invested in those kinds of companies, but you know, I would look at Demodran's work. Uh, Aswath Demodran, professor at NYU, he puts out a lot of great valuation videos. I think he's valued. Beyond Meat. I know he's valued Peloton. Um, he's done a number of startups. So I would look uh, to guidance from him. And he says something really interesting. He says, the harder a company is to value, um, and in a lot of cases, that's because there's just so little financial kind of history to go on. The harder it is to value a company, the more potential upside you have by doing that work of valuing the company. So um, even with a company like Beyond Meat, you know, I would say, you know, give it your best shot in terms of coming up with a valuation. Um, but it's harder. It's harder because, you know, there's with with so little history with, with a, a newer company, I mean, there's such a range of potential outcomes over the next 10 years for a company like that versus a company like Apple, who, you know, is is kind of driving this aircraft carrier, right? Um, there's just a lot more that can happen uh, with a smaller, newer company. Uh, but, you know, th that's not to say, that's not to steer you away from trying to value it. I think uh, it's a very worthwhile exercise. You may just demand a, a higher margin of safety because, you know, the out, the range of outcomes is so much more uncertain. Uh, Andrew, if all your shares fell by eighty percent tomorrow and remained at that level for the next ten years, what would you do? <laughs> I like this question. So there's a few ways I would answer that. If all your shares, um, I assume this is over multiple companies, not just all of my shares within one uh, within one company. Uh, but if I had a portfolio, say five companies that I wanted to hold for 10 years um, and they dropped by 80% and stayed there, uh, I would really question my ability to value companies. I would question, you know, why am I picking stocks if, you know, my entire portfolio 
dropped 80% and stayed there. Um, might not be uh, the best you know, avenue for me. Uh, I would probably decide after three or four years um, that, all right, I should just be investing in an index fund or, or a couple different index funds and not picking individual businesses. So that's how I would answer that one. It's an interesting question. Thanks for that one, Andrew. Uh, do you have any insight on Racis? So Racis is a company that Monish Pabrai is quite bullish on. He sees it as a spawner. Um, I believe, I don't think he's ever specifically said that, but it's a company in Turkey. Uh, they own a bunch of warehouses. Um, and, you know, when Pabrai was looking at it, I think the market cap was like 30 million, something like that. And he valued uh, the real estate at somewhere between 300 million and a billion. Okay. So a 10 to 30 X upside on that. Um, there seems to be no write up, nothing. Also, Pabrai's employee owns the stock. It had huge cash flow during the pandemic, but also much debt and negative income. Um, I don't have any insights. Probably what I would do, I can't buy Racist. At least I can't figure out a way to buy Racist in Turkey. So I haven't dug into it because it just wouldn't be a good use of my time. Um, but probably what I would do, I would listen to Pabrai's last, say, five or six talks uh, that he's put out on YouTube. And, you know, he's given little snippets of his investment thesis for racists. I would write all that down and that would kind of give me some starting questions uh, in terms of what to dive into in, you know, the, the public filings or whatever information is out there on racists. So that's where I would start. Um, I would also look in corner of Berkshire and Fairfax, which is basically my first my starting point when I'm looking into a company for the first time. Uh, so you could search racist in there to see if anything has been written up. Uh, assuming we are talking about great businesses, what are your mental models for selling? So I, I have a, a very easy answer to this. It's, it's kind of a lazy answer, but I'm okay with that at this point. Um, I'm essentially... I'm a cloner when it comes to getting out of a position. So one of my fairly strong rules, it's, it's not across the board, but uh, when I buy a stock, I want a super investor that I really like, that I really you know respect their track record. I respect them as investors. I, I don't want to buy a company unless one of those super investors owns it already. Okay. Um, and then all I have to do uh, if I want to be lazy about it, which I often do want to be lazy about it, is wait until it's publicly known that that super investor has sold, okay, uh, through 13F filings. You can see when, when these uh, investors get out. So that's, that's the short answer. Because, you know, when you buy a company, any company can run into trouble. Uh, the CEO can leave you know, a competitor can come in making their business model kind of obsolete fairly quickly. And so any business can, can have an investment case change. Um, and, you know, if you're going it on your own, you've really got to understand the business and the investment case kind of on top of the business. And um, not that many people are, are highly skilled at that. Uh, often it takes a lot of business experience, preferably in childhood. Like Monish Pabrai, his dad was a serial entrepreneur. So from a very early age, Monish Pabrai got, you know, all of these incredible business lessons of what to do and what not to do. Perhaps more importantly, what not to do. And so, you know, it's, it's hard for an average Joe like me who didn't have that. I, I didn't grow up kind of in a business household, in a business-oriented family. And so, you know, it's so helpful to be able to, you know, at least get guidance from these great investors who have kind of that early programming um, 
to, to know kind of when to get out, when the thesis has changed. Um, when, if you're buying a 50 cent dollar bill, when has it reached a dollar? If you're buying one of these long-term compounders, when is it likely no longer a compelling long-term compounder? And that's, that's when you kind of get out, right? You cut and run at that point. Um, so that's, that's the big one. There's a lot of great questions in here, but that's kind of at a high level how I go about it. Uh, are you looking to invest in stocks that trade below net current asset value? So, um, yeah, I mean, basically I, I want, so I think the question might be, um, am I looking for cheap stocks? Okay below net current asset value. Usually net current net asset value is used for holding companies, um, for a company that has a portfolio of businesses, right? Uh, book value is something that's more commonly used for an individual business. Um, I, my priority is not so much to buy below some asset value. My priority is to identify great long-term businesses, okay? That's priority one. Uh, that's really what Pabrai has pivoted to is, you know, identifying the Amazons, the Costco's, um, these great businesses early on, kind of smaller than 500 million market cap size, um, and then just let it ride, let it ride. So, you know, obviously I want to buy those at as much of a discount as possible, but that the discount is not the priority. Um so that, that's how I would answer that one. Uh, will there be any inflation-based changes to your portfolio, Verizon, Costco, for example? Or do you feel comfortable with your current setup, SRG, Micron, Shinikin? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with, with my current setup. Uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head fully around how I want to play the inflation, inflation card. And I don't know if I do. Uh, it's it's really more of a macro theme, uh, the, the whole inflation thing. Um, I think it's it's enough for me to just focus on finding individual businesses that you know are going to do well. And part of that is having pricing power, right? If inflation really takes off, uh, it's so important for a business to be able to raise their prices without losing a lot of business, right? Losing a lot of customers. Um, you know, Micron doesn't, doesn't really seem to have that, uh, because it's, it's largely commodity based at this point. Um, seems like, you know, SRG and Shinikin do have quite a bit of, uh, you know, pricing power, uh, great businesses to hold in a high inflation environment. Um, but, you know, Verizon and Costco, I'm going to do a valuation for Costco, I think, uh, later this week. Um, I haven't valued that before, so so that'll be interesting. Um, it's one of the companies I'm seeing kind of bought a lot in Corner of Berkshire and Fairfax. There's a thread I follow, what are you buying today? And Costco has been coming up more and more. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, I'm not... I don't think I'm going to make any kind of dramatic changes in my investing approach uh, because of the possibility of higher inflation moving forward. But it's something I've been thinking about. What do you generally use as your required rate of return and margin of safety? Um, using Filtown's 15% rate of return and 50% margin of safety means every stock on my watch list looks insanely overpriced. Yeah, that's for sure especially in the U.S. I get that I'm likely missing a few gems, but also wondering if that rate of return with that margin of safety is overly optimistic these days. Um, yeah, Microsoft, good luck with that one, uh, with a 50% margin of safety. Um, well, you know, there's a few, way, a few ways I could answer this. Um, one is that it's okay to be unreasonable, all right? There's a great book called, what is it called? The Art of of being unreasonable, I think something like that. Um, you know, all we need, as Pabrai would say, is one or two investments a year, 
Okay, so I think we should have very high standards for buying into a company. Um, I, I don't know that I have a set kind of required rate of return and margin of safety. It's, you know, because it's I'm looking for these great long-term businesses that I don't need a huge margin of safety on because it's not that initial discount that's that's going to make me the big bucks over decades. It's getting into that business kind of early on um, that has these superior economics. Uh, so that's been a little bit of a shift recently for me away from insisting on this big margin of safety. Um, and instead looking for these long-term compounders. So, um, yeah, I would say it's okay to be unreasonable. Uh, I certainly would not be buying Microsoft at current prices. Uh, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a mistake to do that. Uh, it's just, it doesn't really make sense to me um, based on what I'm looking for. Um, who are your absolutely five top gurus and who do you follow on Twitter? So I'm going to do, thanks for the uh, poke there, I'm going to do a video hopefully in the next week or two on who my favorite follows on Twitter are. Um, there's some really great investors on there that I'm really enjoying uh, following and reading kind of what, what they're posting about. Uh, top five gurus, you know, if I had to list them off the top of my head, Monish Pabrai, um, Buffett, is still up there. Um, Lee Lu, those would be the, probably the top three. Um, and then there's there's a company, a fund, Massive Capital. Okay, very small. I think it's $3 million. Uh, they're not going to have 13 Fs, obviously, because they're too small. But they put out a quarterly letter to shareholders. Um, letter to investors, where, and they talk a lot about their ideas. So that's something I'm enjoying. And I'm really looking at this point, I'm looking for gurus, um, gurus, it's kind of a funny word, uh, great investors who are buying more in the small cap space. Um, Ian Cassell comes to mind. I follow him on Twitter. Um, so, you know, that, that's five right there. I'll, I'll go with those five uh, at this point. How strong is your conviction on Shinikin? What percentage of your portfolio? Where do you see the future for the company and what is the catalyst? Um, Shinikin is, is um, you know, it's a company I'm still diving into, still learning about. I, I made a video yesterday, I'm sure many of you saw, where I put... You know, just $1,000 for my four-month-old daughter. I'm, I'm kind of starting a fund, uh, uh, an account for her. Um, so just a $1,000 bet on Shinikin in there. I haven't started buying Shinikin uh, personally. So um, it's, it's not any percentage of my portfolio. So I have both a Robinhood account and a TD Ameritrade account. I, don't, I can't buy it in Robinhood. I don't think I can buy it in TD Ameritrade either. So um, I, I don't own it personally yet um, in my accounts. Uh, I, I may move everything over to Interactive Brokers. We'll see. Um, I haven't had a great experience on that platform so far other than pretty cheap uh, in terms of fees and large availability of companies internationally that I can buy. Well, where do you see for the future of the company? What is the catalyst? So the catalyst, uh, to me, the catalyst is value, right? Value can be its own catalyst. Um, that's something Pabrai uh, says in his letters fairly often. Um, when you buy a company at, with an acquirer's multiple of four, um, where the enterprise value divided by earnings before interest and taxes for the last year is four. Um, that is really cheap, okay? Uh, you know, Pabrai really likes what he's seeing with the management team. You know, there's a 30-year history to look at, and there's just, it's, it's a spawner, right? It's a spawner-type business. Um, so, you know, it seems like it's got great a great future, ahead. And, you know, there's 
there's uh, aspects of the real estate market in Japan that I think kind of caused the stock price to be depressed over the last couple of years. Uh, Jeremy Raper did a, an excellent write-up about that. Um, you can search uh, Raper, you know, Raper Funds blog or something like that, and you can find that. But um, yeah, it's, you know, it seems like great management team, Spawner DNA, and it's really cheap. So that's, uh, those are kind of some, some bullet points. What stocks are on your watch list to purchase and at what prices? Very direct. I like that. Also, if the stock hits those prices, is it an automatic buy? Um, so it's not. I put out a video a number of months ago. I had Alibaba on there. Uh, Alibaba hit my buy price in my watch list and I didn't buy it. Um, so it's not an automatic buy. It's more, all right, if it hits that price, you know, it's time to take a look. It's time to spend some time on it. Um, to decide if I want to invest or not. A uh, spreadsheet of what is on your buy list and why would be great. New to your channel, awesome. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so I've been meaning to put out a watch list, a wish list, and it's something I'm still kind of putting together. Um, hopefully in the next week or two, I will put out a video on that um, with kind of maybe my top five. Uh, stocks on my watch list that are kind of close, closest to my buy price. So thanks for the for the poke on that one. Uh, great coverage on the 13F video so far. Thank you. Those tend to do very well. Out of everything you've analyzed so far, what is the most compelling buy you've seen? Uh, Shinikin. Uh, it's really the only kind of long-term Stock I bought recently, not in my portfolio, like I said, but in my daughter's portfolio. Um, Shinikin is the most compelling. Uh, sorry, that was kind of a cheap one. Um, can you analyze Verizon and TSMC? So uh, TSMC Taiwan Semiconductor out of obviously Taiwan. Um, TSMC's moat and business for the next four to five years is solid. I'm not sure if it's undervalued. Um, so I haven't spent really any time on TSMC. Um, I'm used to seeing it as TSM in the US. Uh, maybe you're outside of the US. Um, so I don't know. If you maybe give me a pitch about why I should uh, analyze TSM, um, it's a very large company, like 600 billion market cap or something like that. It tends to be right at the top of a lot of these emerging market ETFs. Um, so, you know, it tends not to be the kind of company I'm looking for. I'm looking for more the small cap uh, type businesses or businesses in the small cap size. Uh, Verizon, yeah, uh, you know, I'm not sold on doing a deeper dive on Verizon at this point. Um, it's not on my watch list. It's something that's really just recently come across my radar. Um, and I haven't seen anything yet that makes me super compelled to do a deep dive on Verizon. But uh, if any of you, if any of you guys have any, um, you know, great write-ups or whatever that you've seen on Verizon that would compel me to go deeper, um, hit me up. I am a customer of Verizon. I put out a video about it a couple weeks ago. Um, just kind of cobbling some things together. But obviously Buffett seems to be pretty bullish on it, uh, which in and of itself is compelling. Um, but, you know, it's it's really not in my circle of competence. And, um, yeah, I just need to see more, something that really kind of hooks me. If you have to invest in Japan and or Turkey, what avenues we have at our disposal? If we know of a hedge fund manager who is under 100 million with no 13F, however, if we know their fund name, is it possible to peek into their portfolio? So we got a two part question here. We are, it's like we're in the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. This is fantastic. Uh, if you have to invest in Japan or Turkey, what avenues? So, Japan, I just made a video interactive brokers. Um, I don't know how to invest in Turkey unfortunately. So that's the answer to that one. Um, if we know of a manager under 100 million, no 13F, 
So I think the only way to find out what um, a manager who's managing under 100 million owns is if you know they talk about those things in their letters to investors. Um, and a lot of them do that. A lot of them write letters that they make public, uh, or you can even get a hold of these letters sometimes uh, if you know people who are invested with them, um, or you know how to do sneaky searches on the Google. Uh, but that's really the only way I know of, is if they talk about those things in their uh, letters or on Twitter. Sometimes they'll talk about companies on Twitter. Have you learned anything new about Shinikin and its management? Um, nothing super new. Are you strictly value hunting or do you consider high growth equity? So I like what Pabrai said about this. He said value and growth, they're really two sides of the same coin. Uh, at the end of the day, what value is, is being able to project out future cash flows, right, for the business from now until judgment day, discount those back at an appropriate discount rate, uh, and that's the value of the business today, right, assuming we're correct in those projections of cash flows. Um, so if it's growing, if it's, if it's growing fast, you're just projecting higher cash flows into the future. You can still come up with a value today. It's kind of the basis of a discounted cash flow valuation. Um, but, you know, like I've said, I'm more interested in these growing companies, these spawner type companies than, you know, the cigarette butt, uh, the 50 cent dollar bill. So that's that's where I'm at at the moment. We're flying through these guys. This is awesome. Uh, I love your videos and I wonder how your current portfolio looks like. Would you be able to make a video about that? Um, yeah, I haven't made a video exactly like that before. Um, yeah, for some reason, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to do that. I think part of why, you know, I really, I want to be uh, educating you guys about how to invest, not telling you what I'm buying. I, I think that's a big trend on YouTube these days. You've got these, you know, YouTube channels with a ton of followers and they're talking about, you know, here's a stock I just put a million dollars into or, you know, I put 50,000 into this stock. And that's, you know, that, that's, it's a lot of hype, right? It's, um, I, I don't think it's, it creates uh, a great environment for learning. It really triggers this like fear of missing out, um, which gets people kind of buying for the wrong reasons. So, you know, I, I probably won't make a video like that, what I own, um, because I really want to inspire all of you to come up with your own process for investing and think critically and, you know, invert the story, do all of these things. And you're gonna have a different circle of competence than I am. You're gonna have a different interests than I have. And so I, I just don't know how much value there is in um, you know, showing you guys what I own. I just don't know if it's you know the best use of our time together to be doing that. So that's that's kind of my take on that one. Um, thanks for introducing me to Howard Marks. Absolutely, he's fantastic. My question is related to valuing a business by using pre-tax earnings, as it says in Warren Buffett and the interpretation of financial statements versus using owner earnings or free cash flow. So uh, I liked Frank's answer to this. Check out uh, what Frank said. I, I have nothing to add there. Uh, what are your initial thoughts on Pin Duo Duo? So I saw Lee Lu bought Pin Duo Duo. I saw Ray Dalio added to Pin Duo Duo. I don't know anything about it. I haven't even looked at it, okay? I, I don't even think I know what, it, I think, is it in the social media space? I, I really don't know. I know it's a Chinese company. I know it's an ADR, so you can buy it through uh, a US exchange. As a US citizen, it makes it very easy to buy. You can buy it on Robinhood, in fact. Um, but that's about all I know. Uh, Li Lu, I think, he took out like a 5% position in Pinduoduo. So to me, it's not very high conviction. Um, 
So I'm not super compelled to take a look at it yet. Uh, and I still have concerns about investing in China um, with kind of a lot of the issues that public companies have had over there with fudging numbers. Um, there's, there's some shady stuff that that I've read about that, that happens in China. Um, so not, not fully sold yet on investing in a Chinese company. So that's, that's my take there. Uh, how much should Shinikin go down before you take a larger stake in the company? I bought in at 1200. I will double my position if it goes under 900. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably a good buy now, uh, in terms of, you know, whether I'd be waiting for a more compelling buy price. Let's take a look at ticker real quick and see what it's trading at and what it's done recently. So we got Shinikin 8909. So you can see here, this is the last year. Let's zoom in a little bit, last three months. So it's just been since, what is this? February 12th, all right? Less than a month, it's just been kind of on a downward tear. We're 1051 Japanese yen per share right now. Um, to me, it's compelling. It's, it's a compelling price now. I mean, Pabrai, you know, I think he was probably buying in, November, December, somewhere in there. So, you know, anything under 1100, you're probably buying in at better than Monish Pabrai's average buy price. So, I mean, that's that's awesome. Um, so it, it's, it's not that I'm waiting for it to go down lower. Uh, I, I don't really know what it is. Um, I, I just went through the process of buying uh, my first foreign stock on interactive brokers. So I, I'm not necessarily in a hurry to, to get into it. Uh, like I said, I can't buy it in my two primary um, brokerage accounts right now, TD Ameritrade and Robinhood. So um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm not in a hurry. Uh, and, but it's also not that I'm waiting for the, for the price to drop. Um, just kind of taking my time with that one. Um, so, and learning more about the business, obviously getting to, getting to wrap my head further around the investment thesis. Um, obviously there's a bit more legwork that uh, goes along with that buying a company in a country that I've never even been to. I haven't been to Japan. So uh, steeper learning curve. Um, yeah, so that is our Q&A, everyone. Thank you all for the fantastic questions. And, you know, I'll be doing another one of these a week from now. Uh, lots of content to make this week. There's a lot of exciting stuff on the docket. So I'm hoping to make a video every day this week. So keep an eye out for all of those. And I will see you all in the next video. Take care.